this is a perfect panel for me to for, for me to work on. Um, I, I know uh, a couple of these whistleblowers here, and um, I have to tell you, they change they change how you think, and they change how you feel, and I hope that after this they'll change how you eat. Um, in a gap, we know uh, how important whistleblowers are to protecting public health. Uh, whistleblowers are our eyes and our ears, and they alert us to the problems uh, within our systems. Uh, some of those problems have potentially lethal outcomes. Uh, from uh, soil to plate, from farms to freight, and from factories to forks, whistleblowers courageously speak out against looming public health threats. They demand safety and integrity in our food system. They warn us of systemic dangers so interwoven in our industry's fabrics that our regulators can no longer see them or refuse to find them. And when our regu regulators do fail to see and do fail to take action, whistleblowers step up to prevent the threat. Uh, actually, uh, first joining us is uh, Christina Meneses, I hope I didn't Meneses, Meneses uh, and she's the staff attorney with the Public Health Law Network, um, Eastern Region. Christina has worked in healthcare law and policy in various forms through litigation, legislation, and developing training for healthcare providers and providing technical assistance for legal advocates. Christina joined the Public Health Law Network after working as a disability law attorney representing individuals with claims under the American with Disabilities Act. Section 5 and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Christina also spent two years at Georgia Legal Services Program, where she litigated on behalf of low-income Georgians in areas of health, in the areas of health, family, public benefits, employment, and elder law. Um, and that's our uh, our hope that uh, Christina will um, uh, show us the links between uh, public health and workers. Um, Next to Christina is uh, former Peanut Corporation of America Assistant Plant Manager Kenneth Kendrick. He uh, repeatedly reported to the Texas Department of Health food contamination issues that clearly posed a serious and widespread health, health threat. All of this happened before the massive salmonella outbreak of 2009 was linked to PCA. Kendrick's whistleblowing conflicted with the company's defense that the taint tainted product from a Georgia plant was an un unexpected and isolated event. Next uh, to Kenneth is Kit Foshi. Kit was the director of quality assurance at the nation's leading producer of ground meat. After 10 years on the job, he was fired in 2001 for refusing to go along with his company's claim that its ammonia treatment process made its meat, meat safe from dangerous pathogens. Sometimes it takes time for the truth to win out. This past December 31st, a page one above a, a, and the New York Times conferred, confirmed Mr. Foshi's allegations. And uh, lastly, rarely do we uh, in the public consider food safety threats associated with transportation and distribution of food. Gap and our allies, however, welcome, um, are, are, are happy to welcome the new protections in these important and often overlooked areas. To tell us more is uh, panelist Matteo Colombi, uh, who, works as a who works for the Research and Campaigns Department at the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. In the past, he has worked as a journalist, strategic consultant, and lecturer in political economy. Has been a lifelong activist for social justice. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll get started with the presentations. Uh, at the conclusion of the panelists' presentations, there will be time for a question and answer. And you can use the mics or join us online. Thank you so much for having me here. This is such a pleasure for me to be here to really talk about the intersection between public health and workers' rights. Uh, like Amanda said, my name is Christina Manessis. And before I became interested and started working in public health, I was a legal aid attorney. Um, and legal aid, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but what we do is civil litigation for low-income individuals. So I got to see how important work was for everyday people and how in maintaining some type of income is essential for every aspect of their lives, um, not just health. So that's where I come from in this particular, um, particular job. 
And now I want to tell you a little bit about what the Public Health Law Network is because it's uh, the place where we're going, where you're going to see how I've transitioned and how we've gotten into food safety and why I'm here. Not about it. So the first question that Amanda asked me to run through with you is what is public health? The honest truth is there's a lot of academic definitions out there. There's a lot of people who talk about it. There's a lot of people who opine and, as it, and in the field. There's many experts. But I, what I came to is a very simple definition by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that really talks about um, what public health means to them. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation believes that every American should have the opportunity to be as healthy as he or she can be. And at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they strive to ensure that all Americans have quality health, public health services and policies that protect, promote, preserve, and, pre and preserve their health, regardless of who they are and where they live. I think this boils down to the very essence of what public health is. It's about community. It's about making sure that everyone in the community can live a healthy life. And that doesn't just mean having access to hospitals or to doctors, um, but it also means taking a look at where we can overcome some of the social barriers that are really making people's health go wrong or illness occur. So it's both a, uh, it's a preventative and also a treatment model. It's really a way to look at health through a holistic lens. It's not just one component. So as we progress through this, let's keep in mind that there's these individuals um, and, that, and they're part of the community. And there's issues in their own communities, in the environment, in uh, all sorts of places that have impact on health. So what is health law? Basically, it's a simple, simple definition. It's applying the law to improve public health. That's all it is. There's tons of laws out there. There's a million and one. Look at the one in the middle. Please pick up after your dog. That, in fact, is a public health law. Because what has happened is that when people leave their pet waste on the street, there's germs, there's bacteria, there's all types of diseases that are attached to that. So that particular law was put in place to make sure that the public was in a healthier place. So this is just one little example, but there's many. There can be, and what public health law um, attorneys really focus on is making sure that we look at every single law that's promulgated or suggested or is like getting ready to pass has an eye towards the public health. So exam for example, if you're talking about a zoning law, yes, we want more business. Yes, we want more enterprise because we need that income into our community. But what does it mean if we have a factory in our neighborhood? What does it mean if they have runoffs that are going into our streams? So taking a look at how the law and, and encouraging business to come into the community impacts the community's health. So what is the purpose of the Public Health Law Network? And this is very much a, promo a promotion for our network because what we are trying to do is to get everyone involved in this process. Unfortunately, as you saw from our last panelists, there are so many issues out there that not one person can tackle, not one organization can handle. It is impossible. So this is why the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation decided to establish this group. And it's basically, it, it comes together to make sure that people are talking to each other. And as the last panelists indicated, there's not a lot of communication sometimes. We're out there in silos. So what we are really looking to do is to gather up all of the experts in the fields and have them start talking to each other, have them talk, start talking to us. That way we could readily disseminate all of this information at one time. All our goal is is to really start applying the law to improve public health. That is our goal. We're, like I said, we're funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and their basic goal is to improve health and to provide health care for all Americans. And it's basically to transform the society into a better place. The way that the network has been established, it's um, a national coordinating center and then five regional offices. And we are spread out across the country, and we all have um, different specialties or a point of contact. Our office is the food safety contact. And we handle environmental law as well as injury prevention. But all of our, all, any public health need that you have, give us a call, because there's someone in our network that has the answer. We also have significant partners um, that are leading the way in different areas, such as obesity um, and, and tobacco control. 
the, the three primary things, uh, services that we offer is technical assistance. And that means, this is especially important for folks out there who may have a question that they don't have the time to answer or they don't have the resources to answer. So we are able, some, the other day I had someone call, for example, um, how, does a school, how can a school start a community garden? What are the legal implications in my community? We got that call, we bipped up the response, we did all the research on the law and sent it back to them. So they have a place to start with. So that's something that some of you may wish you had that time to do. And unfortunately, because our work environment is so quick paced, we don't have the opportunity to look at those small questions or even large questions that you feel overwhelmed by. The other thing we do is we do proactive deliverables. So that is training sessions like I'm here today, talking and getting the word out and talking about um, public health and what that means. Uh, we try to do fact sheets, issue briefs, and webinars, and, and model laws. So if there's something out there, like for example, we're doing some work on concussions, which is injury prevention. Um, hopefully we had a blog out there, and hopefully we'll, there's some issue briefs that will come out. And then we're also talking about doing a food safety um, webinar at some point, once we start gathering all inf information. And I'm so happy to be here, because there's a lot of people I want to talk to. So I'm going to be tapping some folks to participate in that webinar. And then we also want to create the network experts. Alone, I am not that smart, to be honest. I happen to be good looking, but <laughs> I need your help. I need your help to figure out who the experts are and who can come up with the best plan of approach to make sure that we are protecting the public health, the public's health in regards to food safety. Now let me tell you some, some limitations that we have, because with all money, aren't there some strings attached? <laughs> Lobbying and, lit and litigation. We cannot lobby, so we cannot show up and say we support X, Y, and Z bill for food safety. We can't do that. And we can't litigate. We can't handle the cases that, um, that we've heard about this morning. But what we could do is provide that support. So if you need an issue brief to take to your representative, to your, to your senator, we could do that research for you and provide it with a public health slant. What we work on is making sure that we deliver the message of public health. So we want to promote any ideas that work towards that means. So we could share relevant data, research, um, legal hurdles that you may encounter during the process, and we could provide testimonies upon invitation. But we cannot take a, a, a position one way or the other. And we could take other supportive actions. So now that I've given you my spiel, let's talk about workers' rights and why it's so important. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to this conference, and it was on uh, the Food Modernization Act. And it was put on by industry. I didn't know that because I thought it was a general law and regulation understanding. But no, it was about industry. They have, uh, I should have known because the registration was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but I sat there for two days, and I learned so much about the, what's going in and out uh, in industry. They're very well funded. They have lots of money to work with. They have extraordinary lawyers. Because those lawyers that were up there presenting, they knew the law back and forth and could present any point on it. Now, the one thing I walked away with was the fact that I may never eat again. <laughs> I may never taste something. So next time you see me, I'll be very skinny because I was so scared. The lack of regulation, the lack of um, protection for consumers, the lack of responsibility and accountability. One, one particular attorney um, that I will not mention names or where he practices stood up there and said, you know what, this, this uh, law went into effect, it was signed, and it will have no impact on you for now. The FDA has no money to regulate you. Go on as business goes on, and when it, something happens, call me, I could represent you. So while Bill came up this morning, he says he drives a Mercedes, they're driving Hummers. They're going out there and they're really enjoying their money and their, and their time. Um, so why is it so important that we talk about workers then? Because w the FDA, yes, has limited resources and I believe that they are, and they're trying to do the best they can with the resources they have. Um, but there is still that lack of ability to go out and inspect all of the areas. So workers are going to be able to provide that frontline um, front inspection let's say. 
So let's talk about why is work important and why are workers important. As I mentioned before when I started, work is critical to health, both psychological and physical health. So the more people work, the more engaged they are in our community and our society. So that's a good thing that this law has that whistle protection because that means less people will lose their jobs. Now don't get me wrong. Do I think this law is going to be the end all be all, no one's going to get fired because they were a whistleblower? Absolutely not. However, they have the ability to now turn around and go to a lawyer and say, I have this claim. And the lawyer could say, yes, there's somewhere I could hang my hat on to bring this to, bring this to trial. And I think that's what's important here. Now, the worker's ability to report food safety, a food safety violation, is for the public good. A lot of people don't understand that um, food safety and workers' rights are not silos. They're not. They are intertwined and affect everyday life. So when a worker has the opportunity to speak out on it, at least there is a moment where society has that ability to process that information and put it somewhere and p potentially get it into the right hands. So that's something that's important to the public. The other thing about this law is that workers can now feel more secure in their jobs. They don't, well, they're probably still going to fear it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say anything about not having that fear. But they could potentially feel more secure in, in the work because of the fact that they are aware of the law. Now, that comes with the responsibilities on um, people who work in this particular field is to get workers to know that they are now protected under this law. So just because the law exists doesn't mean that the workers know. And the perfect example of this is um, when I was working in legal aid, I, would, I, I was uh, in middle Georgia, and I would occasionally go out with um, the farm worker division to do some outreach. And they, there's, there's under the Fair Labor Act, there's a lot of uh, protections that they have to get paid to, for what they worked. However, the farmers did not. And that's a common story across the country, is that the farmers don't pay their workers. Um, so yes, the laws were in place, but the number of farmer, farm workers that were scared to really ask for their money was astounding. So even though the law was there to protect them, we needed advocates to go out into the field and encourage people to work with that law. And the farmers were not happy. They threatened to call the police, get us ejected off the farms, and all of the rest of it. But there still needs someone to stand up and help workers um, um, request and stand up for their rights. So what's the another good thing about this, uh, this protection is that hopefully people will not get fired. So they'll still maintain the income um, coming in for being a whistleblower so they could have their medical care for self and family. I think that promotes health. Um, and then empowers employees to use their skills. There's no one better than a worker to know what the, the responsibilities of that company is because they live it day in and day out. So they're the ones that are going to notice that something on the machine went wrong and something's dripping in there. And we're going to hear that story from, from our, my colleagues here. And the other thing, it's about humanity and dignity. It is something that we need to all understand is that every individual has, uh, has the ability to enjoy and feel protected and to work. And also to feel responsible and feel like they're contributing to something a lot bigger. And I think the, the whistleblower provision talks about that or it, it's implied in there. And then overall, I'm talking about justice. This is about justice, not just for workers, but it's justice for people. People who are part of this, who are receiving the food, who are eating the food and enjoying it, and are now having some more information to work with. And hopefully the whistleblower protection will allow workers to share more information with, with, with not just their company to get them to do the right thing, but also if the company chooses not to do the right thing, that they could go to other outlets and that we then will have that information. So that is my little talk on that. And I encourage you to please, please, please join the network. I think it's going to be, cru it's, it's crucial that we all get on there as experts or someone that knows something about something. You may not feel that you're an expert in food safety, but you may know transportation and what that means to the public health. So please go on there and join. And I thank you so much for your time. <laughs> OK, from the macro level to the hands, uh, feet on the ground level of employees who uh, have protected the public's health through their whistleblowing, um, and, uh, and then to the completely abstract level of a would-be possible whist whistleblower in a very important area. So we'll move on. Kenneth? <coughs> okay. 
Hi, my name is Kenneth Kendrick. I had worked for Peanut Corporation of America back in 2006, uh, hired on as production planner. My wife and I are one of the, are the two Democrats from Texas who made it to the conference. <laughs> so none left there. And I uh, kind of want to go into three parts just quickly into each of the areas where uh, the provision of this Whistleblower Act might have changed some things and hopefully will change things in the future. Uh, from what happened to me in 2006 to when this was reported in 2009 and then the personal effects we have now. At the time when I was working with Peanut Corp in 2006, and I was only there four months, not exactly the kind of business you want to spend a lifetime working in for obvious reasons, still can't eat peanuts on the airplane too well. Uh, I had came in more as an organizational person. I'd worked at a lab in the meat testing industry, so that's kind of why I was hired on with PCA, but it was more in an organizational role. I uh, didn't pretend to be a microbiologist or have any of that knowledge, but common sense workers on the floor can tell you a whole lot when you go into a building where water's leaking on the roof and, and birds are on the roof and then take a scientist to figure out bird droppings washing into a plant aren't exactly the best thing for the public health information. Where this provision comes in, now I was trying to report this anonymously to the Texas Department of Health. Doing it anonymously obviously didn't carry the sort of weight it would if I could put my name and go, I'm this position, my name is this, this is what's going on. Had to do it that way because as uh, we talked about the companies have the money and the attorneys and at the point I was doing this I certainly didn't have legal fees I wasn't familiar with agencies uh, such as GAP and those things being out there so as I'm sending these anonymous emails and doing things to the Texas Department of Health didn't understand that the Texas Department of Health didn't even know the peanut plant existed in Texas and they had never been visited they'd been visited by the uh, Texas Department of Agriculture and certified, so from my perspective, to be certified organically by the Texas Department of Agriculture, you have to have a Texas Department of Health license. Apparently they missed that, the Department of Agriculture. So I'm sending anonymous emails to an agency about a plant that they don't even know exists, even though there's a huge billboard pointing right to it. <laughs> Peanut Corporation of America outlet store local health department, well, we didn't know they weren't registered with the state. Now, we didn't know they were also selling peanuts out of there. <laughs> uh, to our local public at an outlet store. So had this law been in place, it would have been a little more comfortable for me to maybe be public at that time with my name. Don't know if it would have worked or not. Was I scared of being sued? Yes. I do not come from a wealthy family where I can afford to defend against what uh, I knew the investors of PCA had, and uh, they were very lawyer conscious and had uh, their insurance policies in place for people like me who might come forward very, very well prepared, or Mr. Parnell was very well prepared on that part, obviously, as, as we've seen from there. And I knew that uh, products were shipped from Georgia to Texas and back and forth. I had, uh, in the news at the, when this uh, outbreak had broke out in Georgia, we talked a lot about the first Nestle audit where Nestle had came in and failed them on an audit. I was there for Nestle's second audit, which no one has looked at as of yet, which, and it wasn't much better than the first audit. So I did the reports the best I could at that time. The second Nestle audit taught me a lot and taught me a lot of what was going wrong. I had to, I had to learn from this person and go, these are the sort of testings we need to be doing. We weren't doing environmental testing for, when I say environmental testing, this is where you get swabs and go throughout the plant and you're going to try to find if there's E. coli, salmonella, whatever, out on the floor. Coming from a lab, uh, I knew a little bit about that, was able to take the advice from Nestle, knew we weren't going to get the contract, they were dishumoring us. Although I did have a plant manager in Georgia say uh, when we sent off our first sampling, you know, if you microwave those sponges, they would, uh, our results would look a lot better. Didn't tell me to microwave them. Just let me know that the results would look a lot better if we did. I heard later that uh, from a reporter that it, it got information from the uh, Texas Open Records Act that uh, once the Texas Department of Health finally figured out they existed, they, they asked that current plant manager, if you're going to microwave them, well, how would you do it? And he showed them. 
thought it's a little bit curious that I would, and you see it dries them out. I'm like, well, I guess you tried that. <laughs> I wouldn't have known before uh, to do that. So after not being, you know, couldn't get the appropriate attention to get someone out there and decided to move on for various reasons. I quit on my own accord and it, it, it just wasn't going to work. Didn't know the impact it would have years later in my life. But uh, if I had not had the fear of retaliation, maybe in 2006, we could have stopped this altogether. If somebody looks at Texas, maybe they look at Georgia, maybe some other people live. This came back and even affected my family personally, not knowing some of the contracts they got. Uh, so on my way out, the best I could do, and the plant manager that I was there with, who was an honest man at the time, trying to do his best without any money, uh, I brought in the lab director from where I'd worked before to uh, have what they called their quality assurance staff learn how to do environmental testing, learn how to send these off to a labs. I did not realize at the time that she was training someone with an eighth grade education to be the quality assurance director for the plant. So we're talking about someone, and I'm not downplaying someone who's not educated, but for that type of position when you're dealing with E. coli, salmonella, EB, all sorts of disease vectors, and we're not even on the GED level, this is the person we had doing environmental inspections after I left. But it was the best that I could set up at the time, hoping that things would get better, and I left and tried to move on with my life. Then, in 2009, the Georgia plant finally hits the news and people are sick. So now I'm back on the email because uh, I'm like, no, look, what we're seeing in the media is not right. There's not testing being done every hour. It was only done on request. If a company did not request what we called a certificate of analysis for the lab results, you got whatever peanuts we sent you. And it was amazing to me that uh, there was no regular testing schedule, only if a company requested one. The reason being, too expensive, didn't want to spend the money on it. We're not going to test regularly. Now, I knew in the beef industry, there's testing every hour and other things. Peanut industry, there was no such standard set that testing, you know, need to pull a sample every hour, need to pull a sample every day. Heck, I'd have settled for that at that point. Randomly went out. I had to go to the website and figure out what the results should look like and what the standards were because no one at Peanut Corp knew well, they'd get a certificate of analysis. Is this too high? Is this too low? I had to do the internet research to figure that out. So when this broke in 2009, uh, thank goodness during my email campaigns, the Department of Health is, I'm, I'm just yelling and screaming, trying to get a hold of anyone I could. Uh, Safe Tables, our priority, was the one place that answered and kind of got me in the media at that point and got me set up with FDA investigators which was difficult. And this is where you take the personal interest. In a million years, I never would have guessed that Peanut Corporation of America could get a contract with a big company. Nestle had done an audit and, uh, yeah, we're not buying anything from you guys. We have some standards. But somehow Kellogg's did have. And so three years later, I have no clue that Peanut Corp of America is selling uh, to Kellogg's, selling peanut butter to Kellogg's. And here I, my family, with my granddaughter, who I think the world of, and this chokes me up, and my mother-in-law were living with us at the time, and she had cancer, and I'm giving them Austin brand crackers because my granddaughter's sick, and because my mother-in-law is sick, and it was the only thing she liked. So this came back around to bite me by not being able to get attention because uh, those crackers were tainted. To this day, my granddaughter will still go down the aisle and go, crackers make you sick. She's only four now. She was just two at the time. So this is where you take your personal interest. You never know when it's going to come back to bite you yourself. And that was gut-wrenching to know that she was having salmonella symptoms and I'm feeding her crackers from a company that I used to work for going, how could anyone ever give them a contract? Of course, they had third-party people looking at it. No one's testing the final product wasn't in their interest to, pe to test the end product. And that was where my involvement with Kellogg's was, which was also one of the people I was yelling and screaming trying to get attention from. And once again, I think Nancy Donnelly from 
stop from getting there and then she got me with Gap also so that I was able to go public and go on television and be able to say those things because at the time that Georgia was being looked at and people were dying, no one was looking at Texas. It took a lot of yelling and screaming and me saying there's no regular testing as was advertised on their website going on. They tried to say there was uh, no products going back and forth from Georgia to Texas. I watched those trucks get loaded and go back and forth, brought in the peanut butter from Georgia into the Texas plant. I knew it was there or it at least it happened in the past when I worked there. And so even pitching the fit, going public, still took a while to get the FDA's attention. Then finally the Texas Department of Health goes, oh wow, maybe that plant does exist, huh? Maybe we should go out there and look at that. Took them two trips to figure out where the problem was and I had to explain on the phone, hey, uh, did you look at the leaky roof? Did you look at the false ceiling? Let me draw you a map <laughs> of this plant so you can look at the flooded basement. So when we talk about putting some of the things on the state level, we know that can vary from state to state. The uh, Peanut Producers Board in Texas had went on television shortly after I did once when I was telling my story about how I had been blackballed after being a whistleblower and said, we've made changes. Never named a specific one. Uh, I know the Texas Department of Health got with the Texas Department of Agriculture. They ran some cross matches and found over 500 plants, or 500 food facilities. Uh, Tracy may help me, it was, uh, it was 523, something like that. Over 500 places who had never been uh, registered with the Texas Department of Health, so who had never been inspected. So there's 500 places with no regulation whatsoever who had never been looked at. And that was just one tape match they're still being opened and there was absolutely no civil penalty. When I called their press secretary, it was, well, we want to get people into compliance. If, I get, if I'm speeding, the officer is going to give me a ticket. He's not going to get me in compliance. When you have uh, 500 plants who didn't bother registering with the Texas Department of Health, the state result was, well, let's just get them registered. We don't care that you went this many years or ever how long it was without being regulated something everyone needs to be aware of. It's not good for the state, I would think, on uh, their economic front, but sometimes we don't think that far ahead. So uh, with that happening in 2009, getting finally got that plan investigated, it, it took a personal toll with the crackers that it went through with my family, with me not knowing any better, which made me look real stupid, by the way. Here I am feeding my family stuff that came from that plant not knowing any better. You can just picture how horrible I felt about making my own family sick because even I couldn't have guessed that PCA could pull off a contract like that. And kind of the third thing I wanted to go into is in the whistleblower laws is where that has affected my life now. I have literally set in on job interviews, and I'd worked for the state of Texas in social services, set in with private companies, said, oh, we recognize you from the news. You're very qualified for this position, but we, and I've been told this directly twice, we are not going to hire you because we know you're a whistleblower. You're smart enough to know everything there is to know about this job, and if we're doing something wrong, we're afraid you'll turn us in. Sorry, you're qualified, but we're not going to have you. When this broke out in 2009, I was working for another, uh, for a medical company. It was FDA regulated and it was Watch Kenneth. So when I got sick and went in the hospital, they got rid of me as quickly as they could. Since then, my income's been in half, been cut in half. My family and I are looking at foreclosure. I mean, the, the financial, personal, family problems that have resulted in doing that were enormous. So that's where when we start getting these laws in place, to protect people because there is still a fear out there and the toll it took on my life was enormous in doing that one. I would do it again because you have no choice. I'm not going to let people die. But without those laws in place, it has a very, and excuse me, I get emotional, a very devastating effect on the people who have came forward and they did have reason to be fearful of doing it. The employees that were there had reason to be fearful of doing it. it uh, it took a toll on my life and it takes a toll on the other people who report this and you have to be careful how you do it. So I'm glad to see some legislation come through. Even with this legislation I would have been scared not to be anonymous. But that's just kind of a brief overview of my story. Uh, 
on what we're doing coming forward and even leaving that plant. I was glad to hear Mr. Marlar talk about the possible prosecution of some of the PCA staff. When you're the one who felt like you've done the right thing and your life falls apart and the owner is now a consultant in the peanut industry and is financially prospering, that is extremely something that will make you extremely angry that your life has fallen apart that, and I'm one of the lucky ones that I caught it new enough about it to quit feeding my family those crackers. Other people died, lost much more than I can ever dream of because of it and this man is still prospering as a consultant and uh, I hope the public pressure stays on there to change that. I appreciate you guys' time. My name is Kit Foshi. Uh, I want you to, I'm a previous whistleblower. I, ho I really hope that you get to know Kenneth. You talk to him, you pat him on the back, you encourage him, this is what it's all about. I'm sorry, I'm biased, but I think y'all are here for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I'm gonna take a little time. I do think you need to listen. I'm from industry and I am a whistleblower, so I'm a dead man. Mm -hmm. But. I have, uh, excuse me, a wide background. I was in a USDA regulated facility. I worked for Beef Products Incorporated. Uh, left that company, was in a ready to eat industry, so I know about ready to eat products, and now I'm in an FDA regulated facility and in the grain industry. So I have a wide range of knowledge and background to speak towards this sort of thing. Um, I would like to tout beef products. A company here that, this is public information, this is their website, this is uh, exactly what's posted. And what exactly are we talking about? BPI, if you'll read here, BPI's products are found in the majority of ground beef produced in the United States. Do you eat at McDonald's? Do you eat at Sonic? Do you buy ground beef in the grocery store? You're eating this product. America is eating this product. Do I have your attention yet? Please. Okay. I happen to like ground beef. And I like hamburgers. I think there's a few people in the United States that'll eat a hamburger. BPI is for the future right here. BPI, we anticipate production to reach 10 to 12 million pounds per week within the next year. BPI's ultimate goal is to have our products incorporated into all ground beef. All, not a little, all. If you eat ground beef, you will be eating this. And they're gonna go international. Mexico, Japan, Canada, okay? Product usage. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. Hopefully this will further get your attention. It's in hamburger patties, fresh and frozen, low-fat hot dogs, taco meat, lunch meat, chili, beef sticks. It's in a lot of things you do not even think about. You are consuming this product probably daily. Do I still have your attention? Mm -hmm. BPI promotes food safety. BPI has been awarded the Black Pearl Award. They're one company that has received this award that they're the pinnacle of food safety and, and they, if I read here, they adhere to standards, okay? They pay attention. They want to be here. They've got the Black Pearl Award, Food Quality Award, they're highly recognized. Pretty soon we'll have the Food Safety Summit here in Washington, D.C. BPI is a huge promoter of the Food Safety Summit. They want you to believe they're all about food safety. Actually, we have a couple of representatives from BPI here. I would like, to, I, you know, let's give them a hand. Look, look at all they've done. 
Look at all they've accomplished. Look how they promote food safety. They're here. Are y'all here to protect the whistleblower? Are you here to promote the Food Safety Modernization Act? I'm gonna tell you right now, they're not here, and this is about me, because they're here with their tape recorder, and they're gonna find out if they can find a way to shut me up. We're gonna use their website because this is public information. They've got sealed documents that if I say anything about, they're gonna persecute me. So we're gonna be safe and we're gonna try to stay here on their website and I'm gonna talk about their website because this is public information. The process, right here. BPI collects the beef trimmings they, they use a raw material that's about 70% fat. They spin off all the fat, they get rid of the fat, and they produce a very lean meat product. That's why companies are buying it. They can produce a leaner meat product cheaper using this product. So here it says they desinuate. They take, this mouse does not like me. Okay, they take, the outside pieces of the carcass and they put it through a desinuing device. This is a grinder. And they grind it all up and they try to get all the non-functional protein out so that they can make a meat product that they can mix with ground beef. From here, I wanna go to food safety. And I think this is relatively safe because I just said BPI uses a grinder. BPI elicits the hazard analysis critical control point system, the HACCP system. Okay, since BPI mentioned the HACCP system, I think this is free information that BPI utilizes HACCP, but if you will look it up, I just told you they have a grinder in their operation, but under HACCP, BPI is raw, not ground. You have a grinder? You're going into ground beef? Would y'all care to explain that to me? Why do you, why do you not want to be in the raw ground area. You know, I, I don't know, but I happen to know from regulation that if you're in a raw ground product, you undergo salmonella testing through the USDA. Is that a potential that you're trying to avoid salmonella testing? That you're avoiding an action that could make your product safer? Would there happened to be a possibility that this product is extremely high in salmonella. Why would you be, why would you want to do that? <laughs> HACCP plans should be able to be viewed through the Freedom of Information Act. I would challenge you that BPI is classified as raw, not ground and it is my opinion that they are doing that to avoid regulation. Going back to the process, BPI has to separate fat from lean. Right here, the trim is then tempered to near post-mortem temperature, they heat it up. They heat it up to a temperature that happens to be where bacteria love to grow. It's optimum growth for bacteria. I want you to keep that, that in mind. We're gonna come back to that. That's optimum temperature to grow bacteria. Food safety, we promote food safety. This is BPI. Pathogen reduction. <clears throat> Two independent studies here, Iowa State, National Food Lab. They're telling you that we spent hundreds of thousands, okay, probably $100,000, a lot of money on independent testing. We got it approved and BPI uses ammonia. Look up Mr. Clean. 
Do you want to know that when you go to McDonald's, instead of two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on the sesame seed bun, that it should say, with Mr. Clean? Would you like to know that? That's somewhat why I'm here. I think you should know that. You should be able to make a choice that the beef that you're eating is treated with Mr. Clean to clean it up. You don't know that. That's a little, boom, I hope little light bulbs are going off. I didn't know that. It's true. This study, they're saying it eliminated E. coli 0157 as well as reduced salmonella and listeria. I'm telling you, this study, public, is false. Oh, it happened. It happened in a controlled laboratory environment. Their process, they never run like this study is. This, this meat that was caused those reductions was nuked. The pH level was all the way up to 10. On their HACCP plan, public information, the pH level will never touch 10. If they want to come up here and talk about it, they can come up here and talk about it. But I challenge them that they have never made this study reality. They never see those kind of reductions in real life in their facility. And the ammonia smell coming off this product is outrageous. No consumer would buy it. You will not buy it, buy it if it stinks like ammonia. But this is the information that was given to the USDA to get this approved because the USDA saw it and said, crud, this is almost like cooking. They ate it up. Because it was represented in, as this is real life. This is not real life. This is not what BPI does. You will not see in any of their records in their production that they ammoniated up to a pH of 10. Because they can't get rid of the smell. And they do not tell anybody that they're using anhydrous ammonia. They hide behind ammonium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide technically is odorless. Find some of BPI's product and I guarantee you will smell ammonia. Just real quickly, I'd like you to notice that these are two independent studies. Listeria, they claim they lower listeria and it's really ammonia that does the job. This is, and I, I should not be able to get prosecuted. This is right here on their website. This is public information. You can look it up, www.beefproducts.com. Listeria is they, a 0.02 reduction after they nuke it with ammonia. I, I can't even believe they want to claim this. You really want to say that? If you look down here at the bottom, the significant reduction is when they use a souped up meat grinder. They take this product when it is frozen solid as a rock and they run it through a meat grinder that is so souped up that it can still grind it. Does the normal meat packer have that kind of grinder? Are they going to see that kind of reduction? They see the reductions when they grind it, not from the ammonia. Down here at the bottom, this, this, is, this is somewhat, this is exactly why you need to hear from whistleblowers. And this is other things that are beyond the realm of USDA and FDA. This is advertising. BPI and their finished products resulting from the use of blending bone and inoculated beef studies, blending BPI's boneless lean beef at a 15% blend rate with inoculated ground beef resulted in E. coli 015787 reductions of 0.25 logs. <clears throat> this reduction exceeds the most probable number of organisms associated with large notable outbreaks in 1992 and 1993. And they're quoting the study down at the bottom. Okay. Total, this is public information. They're quoting it. The study says the 0.25 reduction is insignificant. 
What BPI isn't telling you is they didn't count for when they diluted the inoculated ground beef with 15% of their product. That 0.25 log reduction goes away. But what they're saying is if you have, a, you're doing a test and you have 6 million E. coli 015787 that they did some testing and 30,000 of them died. Mm -hmm. So they're saying they killed 30,000 30, E. coli 015787, so if you had it in your ground beef, it'll eliminate it. Okay, guys, listen, I know you're attorneys and I used to be in food safety. I want you to listen for just a second. You have to change it in that ratio to where now, if you have 90, you're still gonna have like 85. This is false advertising. This is absolutely false. You're killing nothing. You're not getting rid of the oak E. coli 015787. This is totally misleading to the consumer to try to get people to buy your product and you want to promote that you're a safe company to further your sales, to further your sales. And you get a black pearl reward. The reduction in populations of pathogenic bacteria reported in this study would provide a significant margin of food safety in their product. They leave that off. This is public information. You want to sue me? Sue me. It's on your website. Why don't you quote your studies correctly and quit trying to mislead the consumer to think if, BP, if, if a company will use BPI's product in their ground beef that it makes it safer. It's absolutely false. But that's what BPI wants everybody to believe. BPI is actually a detriment to food safety because they told companies this and they decided we don't need to test further. They started eliminating testing because we can use BPI's product and our problems are gone. It eliminates it. And heck, I can see why they would believe them because what idiot would claim that? I haven't figured that one out either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it will generate sales, and that's what BPI is about. That's what this industry, this company, this Black Pearl Award company wants you to see. They want to use their food safety claims. They're, they're the antichrist. Mm -hmm. They want you to believe they're all about food safety, but they're all about sales. Mm -hmm. Salmonella, since this is absolutely false, there's still salmonella in the BPI product. That's why it's raw, not ground, on their HACCP plan. They still don't want to be tested because it's still in their product because these numbers are false. They're not reality. Yeah, they really happened. They don't happen in their plant. This is a fiasco. This is a sales technique. Staff, I wanted to come back from staff to staff. Staff is generated from heat abuse. BPI <laughs> keeps this meat at a higher temperature so that they can separate the fat from the lean. How come you don't have a staff number here? Could it be that it's actually worse? Mm -hmm. It is worse. The staph numbers are worse. The product is heat abuse. Staph is a very resistant bacteria. I am a food scientist. I understand this. Staph is gram positive. It has a cell wall. It's very difficult to kill. Just like listeria. That's why the numbers are lower. They don't want you to know that actually there's higher staph numbers and cooking, if there's a staph issue, does not make you safe. Staph is the toxin. You can't cook away the toxin. You can kill all the staph you want to by cooking it, but you're not going to get rid of the toxin. They only show you what they want to show you. Microbial testing. I would challenge BPI that they say that their testing, the, the rigorous testing that they go through, that they're at the top of the industry is a farce. 
I know that BPI strongly avoids the testing methods that I almost with Kenneth could come back here that he's very knowledgeable on, on which testing methods are actually the best and the most sensitive to actually find the pathogen. BPI, go back to the records and let's find out when BPI started using PCR testing to try to find E. coli 015787. All they wanted to do was use a test that gave them a negative. Give us a test, give us a negative, we'll market it, we'll send it. Whether the product's actually negative or not is very debatable because we're not going to use the very best test out there to find the E. coli 015787. But BPI is going to sit here right beside Nancy Donnelly and they're going to say, we're all about making food safe and we're all about product testing. Okay. I'm glad to be in D.C. again. This is a lot more enjoyable. This is, uh, they'll talk about whistleblowers and vindication. I'm getting a little, hmm? it's fun. Hmm? And if y'all want to hear more, I'm just getting warmed up. I'm just getting going. I could go for, I could go for a couple of hours. Last time I was here in D.C., I got to go with the uh, owners and management of BPI to go talk to Washington, to go talk to USDA to go falsify and misrepresent the data to get ammonia aiding approved. BPI falsifies data. They don't set standards, they break standards. They break the rules. They lie. They falsify. They misrepresent. BPI is a company that has knowingly shipped product that was positive for E. coli 015787. BPI had a policy where they would test one box produced per day for E. coli 015787. When you got a positive, you want to know how much product was discarded? That box. <laughs> Everything else was sold. I knew this information when Nancy Donnelly visited BPI. It made me sick. If she only knew the truth. BPI, do they have state-of-the-art facilities? Yes, absolutely. Will you find a bad weld in one of their facilities? Is it all stainless steel? It's because they want everything that you can see to look immaculate. But underneath, it's not such a pretty picture. It's not pretty at all as to how well they promote food safety. Why whistleblowers? Because companies can falsify, they can false advertise, they can misrepresent information to the USDA. You need whistleblowers. USDA is great. I now work in an FDA facility and I would say USDA is far beyond that. U FDA, sorry I speak real bluntly as a joke. Mm -hmm. The main thing about the Food Safety and Modernization Act is exactly what we're talking about now. You need a whistleblower. You need, some, you need to send FDA into a facility at about 3 o'clock in the morning. You need to be able to talk to one of those line workers and pull him off and go, would you eat the product you make here? And if he goes, uh, there's your whistleblower. Let's talk to him. I want to talk to that guy. He's a dude that's there. I had an FDA inspection in one of the facilities I'm at now. They sent a state person. I appreciate that they did that so that we could have the inspection and start with the company that I'm working for. The guy was used to looking at restaurants. This was a 70,000 foot, 70,000 square foot facility and I couldn't get the guy out of the bathroom. Because that was all he was comfortable with and trained to inspect. He looked at, wow, you got paper towels, you got soap, you got a trash can, you can wash your hands, good to go. You're set. It was a joke. It is a joke. You need, to, you need to be able to talk to the people there. I'm still in industry. I still am in the quality. I still try to make sure that a company meets regulations and sells safe products. I need, I need, I still need laws like this. It doesn't end. It goes forward. This is still happening. This is real. This is a company that's false advertising right now. They're in all the ground beef that you eat. You're eating it every day. You know, I really apologize. I hope we're not having hamburgers for lunch because I'm in trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I appreciate your time. I hope you talk to Kenneth more. I know where he's been. I, I do have one final, you know, I gotta, I gotta say one other thing. BPI, I want you to look in my records. They will show you that I got a $30,000 bonus, which I bought a home with. I got another $15,000 bonus and I got a $25,000 raise. I wonder, I wonder if there's something in all these sealed documents that they don't want to know about that I can't talk about right now. And I challenge BPI, why don't you come here to promote a whistleblower instead of trying to persecute one? And let's open up these documents and let's see who's lying. And let's see what the problem is. And let's, let's just get it all out there on the table. And why don't you quit harassing me? I'm divorced now. I sympathize with Kenneth. You try explaining to a spouse, I'm going to give up the $30,000 the $30, bonuses, and I'm going to give up going from $60,000 to $65,000. I was making over $100,000 a year. Haven't touched that since. You explain that to a spouse. Not too easy. I sympathize with him. Thank you for your time. I, I, uh, I do apologize. Uh, we started late, and now we're running late. Uh, but I very much would like Mateo to join us and talk a little bit about transportation and distribution and the role of labor as well. Here are my notes, <laughs> and they'll be on the screen, hopefully. And first of all, uh, I think we really need to compliment these men of courage and great integrity. <laughs> and while the thing gets lit up, the mouse is not fun. fear is a fundamental reality in the American workplace, uh, and it takes a lot of integrity and courage to stand up, whether collectively through a union or as a whistleblower, because you know they'll come after you. They do come after you. And uh, I think we also need to respect people who struggle with the fear and for many years maybe don't come forward. Right? And it's all about creating the institutions and the mechanisms outside and the linkages so that we can support people when they step forward, whether they do it together or as individuals. Being a unionist, I always say, let's fight together. It's not always possible. In this country, managers actually cannot even form unions. In other countries, they can. So in this country, a lot of segments in the workplace, a lot of people are literally cut out uh, of important legal protections. But um, let me move forward with the presentation. Why are the Teamsters here? Um, I'm sure you all know uh, uh, about transportation in the Teamsters. Uh, Teamsters actually play a pretty important role in the food supply chain. And uh, let me present uh, kind of what we do, why we talk to GAP, why we come to these conferences, why we want to be part of this process and uh, this broader movement. So let me see if I can work the mouse. Wonderful. So we're a very you know, ancient American institution, more than 100 years, always been in transportation. In fact, um, at the beginning, a lot of it uh, short haul, not interstate trucking, right? Uh, the Teamsters have been around before the truck, and our symbol are the horses, because people used to drive uh, baked goods, uh, groceries, and all kinds of supplies across America and in our cities, and they had to use teams of horses. Uh, what you see up there is a uh, you know, representation of the, su of the supply chain. And um, we have to fight and fight very hard all together to make it sustainable. But the teams are at different nodes in the supply chain. Uh, we have a food processing division. That's in manufacturing. When the food moves, it's to move to road, go to warehouses, where it gets consolidated and redistributed. Some of it comes through the ports. And here you see all our logos popping. We have, sorry, uh, a variety of divisions uh, that represent work. work workers in different parts of the supply chain, and uh, the food moves through all these parts. And there's a good chance that at some point there's a Teamster that's uh, operating 
and having to deal with the food and with management that in many cases is hostile. You know, just having a union there doesn't mean that you got paradise. When it's not there, well, you know, who knows what goes on, right? Um, so there are 1.3 million active members. Uh, the, the Great Recession, or the Tiny Depression, however you want to call it, has been hitting us hard. But uh, there's still millions of people in the Teamsters. More than 25% of our members are uh, part of the food supply chain. And uh, as organic has been growing, uh, of course, that reflects also in our membership. But we do a lot of organic and conventional food and grocery distribution. Food processing division literally does processing. So uh, uh, I don't know uh, if we do a lot of meat, but we definitely do a lot of work in um, California with processing uh, of the food that comes off the fields. We, don't, we do not do uh, you know, the actual farm. Uh, we have a pretty big bakery division, dairy, brewery and soft drink, warehouse where all the stuff comes together and then gets reshipped and transshipped. And a good chunk of the warehouse uh, membership is in cold storage. And cold storage, that's a critical juncture. What happens in cold storage? Are you maintaining uh, the temperature correctly? <coughs> what happens when uh, there's a failure in that process or in the truck? And uh, uh, what's the level of pressure to deliver the good and make the sale even though you shouldn't? Um, freight, it's uh, pretty self-explanatory, is the trucking of uh, things long distance. <laughs> and then the ports, uh, some of you maybe know about our ports campaign. The ports have been completely deregulated, deunionized. Uh, there's still a tiny membership, but there's really 80,000 people working without any rights. They're mostly immigrants. They make less than minimum wage because they're treated as independent <laughs> contractors. Many of them would like to unionize. And the great shippers of America, the Targets, you know, Target is in grocery. Uh, the Walmarts, uh, Home Depots, and so on and so forth work with the Trucking Association uh, you know, to fight against uh, the ability of these workers. Uh, to band together. And ports are critical because a lot of stuff is coming through the ports and uh, there's a homeland security element to it. And uh, people have, have focused on that for goods broadly, but really we should talk about food security as well. And, um, you know, basically at each of these spots where food moves, the level of regulation, the ability of people to kind of, as communities as, and as workers, to stand up and ask higher standards, that's constantly impeded by uh, what is, you know, very dominant corporate power that wants to be free of all regulations. And also the social obligations that we used to be able to enforce in this society. Do you know the brand? U.S. Food Service, Cisco Foods, Costco, Giant, Safeway, AMP, CNS, Grocery Wholesalers. United Natural Foods, which sells into Whole Foods, 8 O'Clock Coffee, Frito-Lay, Heinz, Conagra, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Alzer Bush, Miller Coors, Bimbo Bakeries, I could keep adding. Then there's smaller names that you know, are regional. Um, all of these are brands uh, that you all interact with probably in a week, in a month. Um, US Food Service, you might not know it, but it might be delivering food to the school. For example, here at uh, the college, or Cisco Foods, or Costco people now, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not here to say there's uh, any specific problem or, 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 or to lay praise. What I'm saying is this is where we are uh, in general, even where, where we have a union presence, the going and stuff, the basic attitude towards the workforce is that the workforce does not, you know, is not to be consulted about what goes on in the plant or the facility, even though, in my general experience, as an activist, is the workforce knows a lot and sometimes uh, knows better. You know, it's certainly in top management. The other thing I know is that a lot of middle and lower management, uh, they, they should be valued more by their corporations because they actually have to manage this, the relationships with the, uh, the workers at the assembly line or at the depot because they know the product, they know the markets, and um, often they're in this uh, horrible position of having to enforce what are socially responsible policies towards the workforce and towards customers. And uh, you know, they're there very isolated in a sense, right? It's their career. Uh, they're supposed to do that job to make sure that there's profit, that there's sales, but they're supposed to do it. And as individuals, many of them want to do it uh, in a socially responsible manner. And you know, mainly out there, it's fear and isolation. So we talked about the whistleblower protection and extending them, and that's very important. And I really do hope, uh, and I'm, you know, we're going to be uh, 
talking from here on out on how to use expanded whistleblower protection and how to back people up. Um, what a union does uh, is really is in the front lines and it eliminates management's arbitrary power to single out, dismiss, or reward or punish individual workers. You know, it kind of limits that ability to, to run a per persecution campaign against an individual. It seeks to improve working conditions and pay through collective mobilization, bargaining, and ultimately getting a contract, which is what allows to regulate the workplace. Uh, that chart just shows you uh, that there is still a, a differential, uh, benef beneficial differential to being in a union. Uh, of course, that's also why uh, unions are seen uh, as such obstacles to this uh, imperative drive to ever increase profits, even though currently uh, the large, cor you know, the top 500 corporations have $2 trillion in cash hoarded up. It's never enough, right? Speaking on product concerns, it's tricky for workers, even unionized workers, because U.S. labor law is not as protective of uh, workers' free speech rights. Uh, it really, uh, the, the labor laws that were developed in the 30s really focused on the economics of the relationship. Um, though over the years, uh, you know, unions have pushed for health and safety and they have played a role uh, in some important consumer fights. Uh, one of the things I do sometimes is work with our friends at Consumer Action and uh, it's a funny story that uh, our, there are you know, organizations that came together and were born in the 70s to work and connect consumer and labor, and then all the way down to uh, the 1930s, uh, where some of the key reforms and, and key uh, civil society organizations kind of uh, came about and started collaborating. And then for long periods, um, you know, everybody kind of works in their silos, and I think this is really a time to reconnect. And we have been reconnecting, that's why I'm here. And uh, uh, GAP uh, and the Teamsters have been uh, in, a di in a militant dialogue, I would say for a couple of years, right, with some campaigns against real companies. Um, a strong and smart labor movement acting in concert with allies is the best frontline public defender. Uh, as everybody's been saying here, we're never going to have enough inspectors. We really need to have more inspectors. And uh, a proactive uh, government attitude uh, would shift the balance. Right? But in the end, we really need people to have the confidence and the protection to come forward. Some of that comes from protecting the individual. Some of that comes with having a union that's proactive, that will protect the frontline worker that steps uh, in front you know, and provides information. Sometimes that happens through campaigns. Sometimes that happens more organically. I think part of the challenge for us is, uh, is to learn how to use the law, is to call our allies, is to kind of build uh, this uh, you know, network of support so that when something comes up and we're conscious of it, that, uh, that people do not have to suffer the level of abuse and persecution that in a civil society should not happen. I mean, you know, the Egyptians are rising against Mubarak, but we have many little dictatorships in this country. Uh, and it's time that we put an end to it. Uh, so we look forward to learning from GAP and everybody else here on how to, you know, um, harness the expansion of whistleblower protection. Oop. I want to make one point. I kind of uh, hinted that with uh, my comment on dictatorship. Uh, what we're talking about here is having the freedom to have a voice at work and from work to speak out to society because these people are respectful of their company's stated mission. Right? This is the company that, that was being run in a manner that kind of undermines its correct mission if its mission is to provide food safely. If, the, if it's uh, what it's obviously stated uh, is, is what it is pursuing. We have had a 30-year assault on freedom of association in this country. This is what, what voice of work looks like in three key sectors. This is data from the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics. The transportation and utilities, 78% of wage earners do not have any collective representation of work, okay? Which means that it's an overwhelming majority, but there's still a core group, and a lot of those are Teamsters, who are holding out in the grocery business, in the grocery distribution business, in the warehousing, in the transportation. And you can see it in the wage differential. And, uh, you know, sometimes we do speak up, and sometimes we are loud, and sometimes we do uh, push ahead both the agenda, the economic agenda of the workers, but with our allies, the consumer agenda. But let's look at the agriculture and related. No one has a voice in agriculture, right? And we know it from the fields to a lot of the processing. 
no one has a voice. And when somebody's gonna step and say, okay, there's something wrong, boom. You know, it's a lot easier to retaliate if they don't have a chopped sword, if there's no union, if there's no contract regulating. Because it's easy also to hide it. You know, they'll come after you, even in a unionized environment, but it's easy to hide it because there's really nothing governing that relationship. You know? Uh, the private sector as a whole is essentially almost de-unionized. It's only 93% of wage earners, when you take the whole private sector, you know, all the industries, uh, have no collective voice of work, have no institution that they own within the plan, the facility, uh, that they can speak of. I, I don't know if uh, the, the, the people serving food at the cafeteria here, here have a union, and I wonder if something came up wrong, how, f how free would they feel to say something, and how would they be protected against retaliation, even in this uh, wonderful setting? And I'm not picking out the setting. I mean, like, that's the reality of endless, <laughs> of most of the economy. Um, I'll go really quickly here, because everybody has, has been talking about already, the state of food supply chain, we face a growing con concentration of power in the corporate side. The tension between profit and food sustainability is persistent. And I feel, in a sense, that because there's so much concentration of power, uh, you know, there's a willingness to use it uh, that is very brazen. Uh, we are very concerned about uh, foreign food getting in, and there's no controls. The ports are completely non-regulated space, completely, towards labor, product quality, you name it, OK? Uh, we're worried about where is government in this uh, picture. We need government to be there. We need government to be responsive. And what we see is that often the workers and consumers and communities are, are split. And we, we think we need to build those connections. Workers face fear and exploitation. And consumers have low transparency. And those two things are taught. They're not disjuncted. Those two things go together. You know, and if we, if we want to change and we want to get a sustainable food supply chain from the farm store tables, uh, we, we really need to reconnect the people that operate and consume the products. Uh, you know, we don't have, uh, I don't know if we have farm workers uh, represented here, and we represent essentially the two slices in between. And our goal is to grow our presence into those two processes. I know that we're short on time, so how do we get it? There you go, I think that is the last slide. Promoting strong unions, the frontline public defenders, uh, I know some of you noticed there was this thing called the Employee Free Choice Act, and I don't think it was messaged right even from our side. Um, really, it's a social need for society as a whole that people have a voice at work. Let the people decide, for Pete's sake, right? And it's a, it's a battle not just for the institution, the Teamsters Union. It should be a battle for everybody here, that everybody gets more voice at work as individuals and, uh, and as collectives. You know? And let's have social alliances between the inside and the outside of the factory gates. And let's defend whistleblowers in law and in deed. I mean, people need support over time and not just financial. They need not to feel alone. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to all of our panelists. Because of the time, I'm going to allow you to find these people and ask them questions on your own.